Hey everybody, video here for you today. This is a request video based on many videos that I have done in this part of the world, the time period going back 12,000 years, maybe sometimes a little bit more. But the plastered skulls coming from Jericho, Tel Aswad, Yiftahel, a few other places, people have been asking a lot of questions, so I'm just going to share a couple clips from a couple different lectures towards the end. I think this is a fascinating subject because we know so little about it. But I have made dozens of videos on sites that go back 12,000 years in this area. Of course, Gobekli Tepe is featured in some of those, but many other sites here. I have probably covered at least 20, 25 that go back 10, 12,000 years. And really, the only thing that we can speculate on about what these people were all about is their symbolism and their afterlife beliefs. That is just about all we have to go on. We have a few structures that are in ruins that we can kind of guesstimate how they live. Here is a video I made last May, 12,000 year old Tell Jericho. I think this is the first time I presented the plastered skulls. What was it all about? Well, they had to have pretty strong afterlife beliefs to honor the dead in the way they did. And the second lecture clip that I'm going to include at the end of this video goes over a, a skull found at Tell Jericho. I've talked about Abu Herrera, a site that research has said was taken out by some sort of impact event 12,800 years ago. Here's a site right nearby, Miriabed. I talked about this in January, submerged 12,200 year old site tied to Gobekli Tepe. The serpent is symbolized at a lot of these sites. Also the vulture, were they trying to say death came to this culture at one time? Here is Tel Caramel, the 12,000 year old younger driest towers. I did this during the shutdown about a year ago, almost to the date, but these were the tallest towers that stretch back to this 12,000 year old time period. Here's another video I made during the shutdown, the Jordan Desert Ruins and the Younger Dryas Natufians. I found a whole bunch of desert ruins out here on Google Earth, showed a few more pics, but these ruins are very fascinating just because they are over a wide expanse. And many of you said these look like the South African ruins that Michael Tellinger has done his research on, and he left a comment here. Good to hear from Michael on this video. I learned a lot doing the video on the Jordan Desert ruins and the Younger Dryas Natufians. I remember that one specifically. But the plastered skulls, I thought this was very interesting to dig deeper into. I found a few more sites. This is Tel Aswad, the faces of the Gobekli Tepe era people. I did this one in January. What was this all about? Why were they doing this? Well, we can only speculate. Here's another one I did, Yiftahel, 9,000 year old con concrete floors, plastered skulls and the tsunami. This was a very interesting one to do. So I just thought I would go into this a little further since there were so many questions and I had so few answers. I just do this in my spare time. A lot of people think I'm into this full time. And I just do this in my spare time offer my thoughts. That's really all I can do, ask questions. But this is one subject that I've always found fascinating. That's why I'm making the video today. Here's another video I made during the shutdown last year when I made like a video 75 straight days or whatever the heck that was. I was going nuts. But I went over the vulture in this one and the serpent at all these sites here. I just think this is a fascinating thing to look into. And the Natufians, I know Andrew Collins has talked about these people also possibly being connected with Gobekli Tepe, but certainly some interesting people to look into, a time period we know very little about. In this video, I showed a lot of artifacts that went way back into time. What were these people all about? There's some fox teeth on a burial. We can see how they lived in a lot of places, but what were they all about? Well, afterlife beliefs, symbolism, a few artifacts. We can only guess. But this is an important time period and faces, faces and skulls seem to be very important. So that's what the lectures are going to be kind of about. But here, some more decorated skulls. Here's a video I made last May, Jerf LMR, Gobekli Tepe's builder site underwater. Went over the symbolism in this video. That's so important coming back from this time period because these people were full of it. And I don't mean full of it, like full of it, but full of symbolism. You know what I mean. But those uh, auric horns were common over a widespread area. Here are ruins that are underwater today. This was lost history in Jerf LMR. I don't know if there's many videos on the site or any at all. 
but I believe I went over the serpent and the vulture in this video also. Afterlife beliefs, how they treated the dead, this is so important. But here are some looks at a site that really not too many people know about and is underwater today. You learn a little bit making each one of these videos. Why did these people always have the serpent on their mind? That comes from the Valley Chorai. Very interesting carving there. Here are some more plastered skulls coming from Yiftahel. Here are some more coming from Teleswad. I just think this is an interesting thing to look into. So I'm going to share somebody's thoughts on this. This is called Human Remains as Evidence for Grief and Mourning, a reinterpretation of plastered skulls from the Levant. I just thought this was interesting. Recording archaeology makes our video shareable. So I'm going to share about eight minutes from a almost 18 minute video. So here you go, and I'll join you when this is over. In typical tag style, I'm trying out some some new idea. Well, newish actually. I've been banging on about this for a while, but haven't quite got my act together to. Um, um, to get these kind of ideas any further. So if you have any um, thoughts on this uh, subject, I'd really appreciate everyone's opinions. Um, I'm going to be looking at um, plastered skulls from the Neolithic of the Levant and a bit of Anatolia, um, which are usually interpreted as being related to um, evidence of status and hierarchy or ritual elites or evidence of social cohesion. And I'm wondering whether we're missing something far more basic and human in their interpretation and whether we can think about concepts of grief and, and mourning and bereavement in the past. So what this project does is seeks um, to look at whether archaeology can provide a role in um, kind of facilitating conversations around death and dying, which may sound bizarre at first, but you know, we, we deal with some really fascinating stuff in archaeology. Um, and for lots of people, it's a safe way in. If we're talking about the ancient pyramids or the, the plastered skulls here, they are um, they're far removed from our own personal experience. You know, we know as archaeologists, we try to understand our, our mortuary evidence. Yeah, it, and, you know, Sarah Tyler, who has written about the archaeology of the emotion, um, as does Oliver Harris and Tim Floor Sorensen. And um, yet we see a reluctance to really embrace the idea of emotion in, in the past. And I'm wondering whether just we're missing something really basic here. So I'm just going to quickly run through some of the evidence I'm talking about, which is based um, um, around sites in the Levant and some of Anatolia, sort of here. Um, and um, dating to around um, 9,000 to 8,000 BC, um, with a reoccurrence in Anatolia um, a couple of thousand years later. Um, now, there's a whole variety of different ways of treating the dead at the time. One of the treatments is to bury someone beneath the floor of a house, um, plaster over the floor, carry on living there, um, and then sometime um, after the death, although probably not so long after the death, you'd return to the grave and um, you probably don't need to be an anatomist to spot what's missing um, in the picture in front of you. They would remove the skull or uh, mostly the cranium. And the um, cranium themselves would often be found reburied, often in, in groups or, or clusters. Some of them had undergone um, further treatment, such as uh, plastering. So what would happen is when the, the skull was dry, a uh, face would be recreated over the bone made out of mud lime or gypsum plasters um, to, to recreate a, a face. Um, sometimes they'd be further enhanced, such as using shells for the eyes. Um, often they would be painted, often in uh, browns and pinks. And you can see the one on the top to the right has got um, stripes across the head. Um, and uh, these are probably some of the most um, in incredible examples from Tel Aviv um, in Syria, where you can see they've um, gone to the trouble of um, depicting eyelashes with charcoal. 
um, incredible preservation, but always also incredible um, skill that's gone into creating these. Um, oh, I, I plug for the British Museum. They've just opened um, an exhibition on one of the Jerry, Jericho skulls run by Alexandra uh, Fletcher. Uh, it's open until February and it's well worth seeing. It's a free exhibition at the British Museum at the moment if you want to see one of the plaster skulls at the moment. Um, we, they've also found uh, these plastered faces. At first they were thought to be masks, but actually it looks like they were, um, have been plastered faces which have been removed um, from, from, the, from the face. Um, and as I've already mentioned, traditional interpretations of these seem to focus around the idea that these were ritual leaders, that these were obviously important people. We don't get so many of them, there's around 90 found in total, um, which, you know, is a, is a fair number, but it's by no means what was happening to everybody. So the kind of assumption is that these were obviously the elite in society, or um, Ian Kite has argued that they were a way of masking inequalities by creating a communal focus for activities. Um, that's all very well, and that might have been going on as well, but I just wonder whether we're missing something really kind of basic in, in, in the plastered skulls. One thing that really strikes me when we look at the plastered role, the skulls is the role of um, display and performance. These were handled, these weren't just kind of kept pristine. They were evidence of um, being worn, of being repaired, uh, the example on the right, um, the skull on the right has got its nose um, broken and mended. Um, we've got the um, skull on, on, on the left had um, a base modelled um, so it would facilitate its upright display, as indeed were the ones on the right. Um, one of the later examples on, on the middle of preservation isn't that great, but these had um, beads inserted for eyes and were found displayed on, on benches around, around a building. Um, the incredible example from um, Chatelhoyek, which is a bit later than the others, but here you've got um, um, the, um, there's just been one plastered skull found on the site, and it's been found cradled in the arms of an, an adult female. And um, this had evidence of um, many layers of plastering. It had been used and reused a number of times. And this is a recurrent feature that they were uh, replastered um, through their use. So I'm wondering if what's going on here is rather than this just being about some kind of way of looking at elites is actually whether this is some way of um, keeping the dead close, um, keeping them within the family, within the household. That was the other thing I haven't mentioned that they're mostly found within household contexts, um, usually beneath the floor of houses or in courtyard areas. Um, occasionally they're found, um, the tell us what ones are found starting mortuary areas, but that's uh, a bit rarer. But they just seem to be within the, the kind of household, household context. So this has got me thinking from working with uh, um, palliative care colleagues today and thinking about grief and mourning and bereavement, whether there's just something going on here and actually whether the plastered skulls aren't showing some motivation to keep the dead longer. Is this the evidence of keeping the dead among And although we can't see the cause of death, I'm wondering whether there's also something else going on that might relate to the age and circumstance of death that might be a motivation behind these plastering of skulls and the idea um, of keeping the dead closer for longer. Um, so just to conclude, these are my um, kind of preliminary ideas. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Can we really use um, contemporary theories of grief and mourning to try and understand the Neolithic? Um, mostly, uh, I myself would have said no, but I'm beginning to wonder whether in certain places and certain times we shouldn't actually be thinking more obviously about um, emotional reactions to death and the ideas of keeping the dead amongst the living for longer. So thank you very much. Now, I like sharing these shareable videos when I don't have a lot of free time to make videos myself. And as I said, I just do this in my free time. And people ask me, what do I do when I'm not researching ancient history? Well, I research ancient history when I'm not doing all the other things I enjoy. So I encourage you to look into people who really dig into this time period. Of course, Graham and Randall, 
Martin Sweatman, Andrew Collins, and I know more and more people are being, being interested in this time period. But 9,000 years ago, that's what this second lecture clip is going to go over, the Jericho skull. Why were they doing this, and why did it seem to go through many periods of history adorning the skulls, the afterlife? Well, it's all very interesting. We're going to hear about the Jericho skull in this clip. This is about an eight, nine-minute clip from an almost 20-minute video. This is called Presenting Deep History at the British Museum. This comes from the European Association of Archaeologists. They also make their videos shareable. So I will leave the full links for these below. I just thought this was appropriate. A lot of questions on this, so here you go. Hope you thought this was cool, and you all have a very nice day. Hi, Space. It's been in Room 3 at the museum, um, and this is a show about the Jericho skull, which um, is, again, a fascinating object. People get very excited about the Jericho skull. It's part of a group of seven that was found at the site of Jericho in 1953 by the King of Kenya. And um, it is a human uh, cranium which has a plastered face added to the bottom of it here, and it has inserted beautiful uh, shell eyes and it's super old, not as old as the stuff that Becky's been talking about but still in the dim mists of time, it's about nine and a half thousand years old. And with this show um, we wanted to look at ways that we could get people to engage with an object that is quite so old, that is to some people quite repelling, people don't like the idea that this is in fact a dead person that you are literally staring in the face. And we wanted to try and engage visitors with some of those big stories that are out there, particularly associated with this period of archaeology in the Middle East. So the first um, big cities are beginning to just have their very, very, very earliest origins. And um, we have huge questions about revering the dead. There's lots of terms that are bandied around, around ancestor cult. There's a lot going on. And we wanted to see if we could tell some of those big stories in this exhibition. So I'm going to take you through it in a series of steps. Step one, thank you, Becky. Step one was being to try and get people to really, really engage with the plastic skull itself. And that was partly by throwing away entirely any idea of timelines. So when Chris is saying, people really want timelines, I was thinking, oh no, I got rid of the timeline. Um, but I got rid of the timeline because of those queries around, we don't really know. If you read the original reports from Jericho, they used this newfangled science known as radiocarbon dating, and they came up with the date for the, the uh, objects from this period of around 5000, 5000 BC. We now know that's way, way wrong. It's way too young. These things are much, much older. There's lots of fantastic research being done around the origins of plant domestication and animal domestication and the dates are swinging backwards and forwards and the public just doesn't care. <laughs> they just don't care. <laughs> they don't want to know about my internal angst about the dating of the pre-pottery Neolithic period. They do not care. Um, and when I said this to our interpretation officer, I said, they don't care. She looked at me with this deep, horrified sort of, how could I not care that the public don't care? But I kind of felt I needed to go with that. So I just stuck to the Jericho skull is about nine and a half thousand years old and left it there to give people a sense that it's really, really old and then just leave that where it, where it fell sort of thing. Um, the really important thing we put on the very, very first panel in the exhibition is we would like you to meet this person because all the way through we wanted to remind people that this is not some alien being, this is not some sort of hairy thing living in a cave, it's none of those preconceptions you might have about period from people from this time period. This is a modern human living actually a very modern life um, and we'll come to um, another way that we we'll try to bring that out in a second. The other thing that I really wanted people to do was look very closely right the way around the object. So a lot of the labels encourage people to engage and re-engage. It was really gratifying watching people interact in the exhibition because they looked at the object, they read the label, and then that magical thing that all curators want to see, they looked back up. Um, and that was great. So for example here, the label talks about faint finger marks still visible in the mud that was inserted into the back of the skull to hold the whole thing together. You can still see those finger marks from nine and a half thousand years ago. Let's have the next slide. Fantastic. So on to some of those big stories, those big questions, those early big settlements. We wanted to bring that through. We brought that through by talking about the site. Um, we went with this image, big image on the wall to try and get across that idea that Jericho is the 
oldest city in the world known with continuous occupation right the way through from about nine and a half thousand years ago, even slightly earlier than that, right the way through to the present day. And we could have written a huge, great big long piece of text all about that, detailing all the different time periods that the city's been through. And in the end, we just went with photograph, which does what it says on the tin. This is the sign to the site. We went with that and tried to keep it really clean and simple. We wanted to engage families, so we brought in the character of Kathleen Kenyon. We did a graphic based on this picture of her, and we had her talking on these extra banners that went through the exhibition with really, really condensed text. The idea being that if you walk in with your family and you have your picked moment, the parents don't, don't need to translate, they can just go straight to the orange banners. These had a mixed reception. Some people said, why is there a nurse taking this manual? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get it entirely right. Some people went, that's rubbish. Why would we just not read the full label? Which, you know, with that, again, a curator's dream, someone that wants to read the full label. But generally, there was quite a lot of positive responses. And we found that a lot of adults read this text first, kind of, they have a child with them or not, and then maybe engage more deeply with the more detailed text above. Interesting little point, Kathleen Kenyon was the daughter of one of the directors of the British Museum, so we made the point in a weird kind of way she was sort of coming home. Next. Um, so we also wanted to bring in research that I've been working on for quite some time, there was about eight years of research left in this, and we did some CT scan <coughs> work with the skull to get past the layers of plaster, which means you can't see what's going on underneath, look at the cranial underneath, have it 3D printed, we put the 3D prints into the gallery so people could see. No, no, you were right, go on. Uh, put the 3D prints into the gallery so people could see what we were basing our research on. They could actually see the skull underneath. And then moving on, we had a facial reconstruction done old school style by the, the original uh, uh, Rich Neve, who did this right from the start. And last slide had people engage with the person themselves. I was thrilled when we got this picture because our point was, this man could walk down any street in London and you would not be surprised at his appearance. Here he is, <laughs> <laughs> looking at himself. And we really wanted to make that point because one of the things that we brought out was that this person had undergone cranial modification. They'd had their skull shape artificially altered in infancy, but it actually had very little effect on how they really looked in daily life. And the point was that their special burial, this plaster face that was put upon them, was based on life experiences that his community knew that he would have been through. Um, so we're bringing in lots of huge themes and questions right the way through the exhibition in the simplest, cleanest way you could possibly think of. 